and great. Okay, so uh, today we're going to be speaking about a intermediate point between two types of structures that we've talked about within category theory and within um, functional programming applications of ideas of category theory. Um, we explored very early on in this class uh, the, the use of functors um, to which amongst other things um, map from category to category, objects to objects, morphisms to morphisms. But um, from a, a functional programming perspective can lift functions uh, to operate on generalized or effect uh, or, or effect loaded uh, values, uh, these, these elaborated values that we capture with, uh, with functors. So um, that was something we explored early on. Uh, subsequent to that, and, and much more recently, we've been exploring uh, monads and uh, where monads uh, have a much richer structure that uh, supports, amongst other things, a sequentialized computation. Uh, and uh, as we know, functors allow us, for example, to capture um, through the so-called fish operator, Kleisley composition, um, composition of morphisms in the Kleisley category, which allow us to express and then compose morphisms that are effectful or in a programming context, effectful functions. Functions that don't merely return a value, but, uh, but also uh, can elaborate that value with certain effects. And we saw how um, in a series of uh, three, or four, three or four discussions, we saw how monads were in fact, monoids in the category of endofunctors. Um, and they observe um, with the uh, triangle equalities uh, and uh, with associativity, the rules of being a monoid. Uh, but uh, functors and in, in monads, uh, while they're useful for working with these effectful values, these generalized values, these elaborated values, um, whether in the form of things like containers or in the form of things like uh, the maybe monad, um, where you may or may not have a value. Um, they're not the only game in town. And there's an intermediate point, um, which uh, has been noted in the pragmatics of programming as a programming pattern, a functional programming pattern, and uh, articulated. Um, uh, through as a, as a pattern, um, but it's also been formalized in a category theoretic sense. And we're gonna be exploring that intermediate point, uh, which uh, variously goes by the name uh, applicatives, lax monoidal functors, um, la lax closed functors. And we're gonna be exploring this today um, with a bit of a looser, um, focus on, on um, the laws applying, a um, little bit more of a, of a pragmatic focus, um, but in a way that I hope will lend some understanding of um, this as a, if not a fully continuum, at least a, a spectrum of, of possible ways of capturing effectful values, capturing these generalized values. Okay, so um, with that uh, introduction, having been made, I'd like to walk you through because it's been some time since we met and even a longer time since we first explored the issues of uh, functors uh, and subsequently monoids. Um, I'd like to go through a bit of a reminder of those key concepts and abstractions um, before we talk about monoidal functors. Um, these functors that preserve monoidal structure, um, and then go on to, to talk about lax monoidal functors and applicatives. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here, and uh, we'll, we'll get going with, um, 
with some aspects of that. Um, okay. Uh, I trust you could see my screen, right? I will yeah. take, okay, good. Is that a yes, Cheyenne? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, very early on, we explored the issue of functors, right? Um, functors uh, occur between any two categories, C and D. Um, they're mappings, but they're mappings that preserve structure. They're not just any old slapdash mappings. They're, they're mappings uh, between categories to map objects in one to objects in the other and morphisms in one to morphisms in the other. Um, but in a way that preserves composition uh, of morphisms um, and in a way that preserves uh, identity uh, when it comes to morphisms. Remember, category theory is really um, about relationships. It's, it's really about not, not the pieces themselves, but how they're linked up. And uh, within the, this context, we have these special identity morphisms, these morphisms that must exist for any category, for any given object. And that when composed within that category with any other morphism must yield that other morphism. And um, when we map with functors, it needs to preserve those identity morphisms, map identity morphisms to identity morphisms. Um, and, uh, you know, while it's easy to get caught up in, in functors as mapping objects to objects, it's, it's really this ability to, to map morphisms to morphisms. That's the main point of interest uh, in terms of their category theoretic properties. And indeed, in many ways, in terms of their programming use in, in functional programming. Um, so with that, um, as a segue, I'll, I'll just remind us that in this context, we're dealing with the quasi-monoidal category of Hast, okay? Um, we've long been dealing with this and it's, you could call it a pseudo category or quasi category. It's um, it, whether it's a full category, it's a little bit of a fiction. Uh, we have this awkward non-termination issue, um, which you can deal with in various forms, but it's a very useful construct. And, and you know, in general, our, our abstractions are approximations. Um, and this is no exception, but it's a very useful approximation. So within this context, just to remind us, objects are types and morphisms are mappings between types, namely functions between types. So we might have, for example, int as one object, bool as another object, and we'll have is even function as one of the morphisms between them. That given an int will indicate whether or not it's even, right? true, uh, true if it's even, false otherwise. Um, and we have this whole you know, cacophony of different types uh, here. And some of them are more basic built-in types. Some of them are elaborate compo compound types. Um, but um, this it may be, a, you know, unboundedly large uh, universe that we're dealing with uh, here. But uh, we have these, the main thing I want you to, to realize is we have these, these functions. And, you know, if we have functors in, in this category, hast, um, functors are going to be mappings from types to types um, and from functions on the source types to functions on the, um, on the destination type. So for example, we might map the float type with a functor into an array of floats, right? Might map um, the bool type that object into an array of bools. So this functor here, when we're dealing with functors in Haskell, pretty much invariably we're going from, we're, go, we're dealing with endo functors, functors that map from Hask to Hask. And so we're mapping like bools to arrays of bools, floats to arrays of floats, um, characters to arrays of characters. Um, and uh, that's, the object side. In terms of morphisms though, um, we get something more interesting, right? 
this mapping of morphisms, because functors map morphisms as well, right? Um, and we say that it's lifted to this other domain. So perhaps we have a morphism between, you know, int and bool, for example, um, in which case we might map each of those over to a list of ints and over to a list of bools and, um, and have a lifting of is even to map a list of ints to a list of bools. Um, if I had planned my comments better, I would have um, used this example of is negative. So is negative might be a, a function that goes from floats to bools. And uh, a functor, the list functor, would map floats to list of floats, bools to list of bools, and would map is negative to the, the lifting of that function, the, the, the map between list of floats uh, to list of bools, something that for every float within this list would classify whether or not it's a bool and and concept that list of, of bools. So uh, given a list of floats, we can get a list of bools. And that's what functors give us, right? It's this, this ability to, to take a, a plain old function on the basic types and lift it so it can operate on these, th these um, uh, functored mappings of that map on lists, uh, from list to lists, or to map from maybe to maybe, um, to map from tree to tree. Um, there's, uh, you know, any number of, of these. And, and that's a very useful ability. We, we lift that function, a function A to B gets under functor F, gets, uh, gets to be lifted to a function from F of A to F of B, where F might be less for example. Um, so functors can be viewed here as kind of supporting operations in a unary way on, on kind of sets of values in isolation. These containers, these generalizations of values, these effectful values. Um, we can use any number of words for it, but the idea is um, if we know how to map floats to bools, we know how to map this generalization of floats, I'll say a list of floats, to a generalization of bools, a list of bools. Mm. Um, or we know how to map maybes of floats to maybes of bools, this kind of embellishment of, of, of floats to embellishment of, of bools, right? That's, that's kind of what these, these functors do. And it's really useful. It's incredibly useful. Uh, now, before we go on, um, to jump into some of these others, I, I need to refresh your mind with monoids. Um, and I argued from this seat, uh, not three months then, that monoids um, have this uh, huge role to play within applied category theory. Um, and they crop up in all sorts of places. And it's, it's not surprising because they, they capture a key element of structure of being able to combine two things in a binary way and, and get out a, a third thing. So right um, in, in classic definition, when we have a monoid, we have a sat, and then we have this product operation, uh, which variously is called a monoidal product or, or tensor product, not, not with tensor in a, in a linear algebraic sense, but in a, in a, in a more uh, just sort of uh, notation sense. And then it critically, it has this um, identity element or un unit element, uh, E, right? Um, and these has to observe, uh, this monoid to be a lawful monoid, it has to observe some laws. So it has to be associative. Um, and uh, you can see the role there. And uh, it has to be unital. So if we combine this, this unit element with any other element in either order, we get that other element back, right? Um, so this provides us this, this nice lawful associative way of combining any two elements to obtain another element that recognizes that there's this special type of element that's, that's unital, that, that serves as, as unit, 
combine it with anything else and you get that thing back. And of course, we have tons of examples of these at a practical level, right? We have natural numbers with plus, where the unit element is zero. You combine zero, you plus it with anything else, you get that other thing. Or you have times with one. You multiply one by any other natural number, you get that natural number back, right? Um, but we also have, you know, other similar ones that are perhaps less familiar, right? With max and zero um, for the natural numbers going zero and larger, you, you, you take a max of zero and any other number, you get that other number back, right? Um, and you can get some of the things logically and with set theoretic operations, like with the power set and, and treating empty set um, under union as, as the unit, et cetera. And it's not surprising given how ubiquitous these are and how foundational um, that we get these all the time in programming, right? So we, um, uh, we have uh, loads of examples like this, some of which extend very directly from this, but some of which are, are a little bit distinct. Um, so, you know, these integer ones, these bool ones, these uh, set ones pretty much came from this list. But, you know, we have the very familiar monoidal operation associated with free monoids, um, as we've talked about in past lectures, which, um, where we have uh, concatenation. And I don't, I'm not sure quite why there's this wayward um, plus there. Um, but we have concatenation of strings and we have the empty string as the unit, right? Um, you could take any two strings and kind of stick them next to each other and append them uh, and get another string back. And, and, and this is free in the sense that we have no further restrictions. We don't take those two strings and kind of compress them down and turn them into a shorter string. No, 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 we just keep on accreting these strings. and. And we're not um, we're not reusing um, strings, saying, "Oh, well, the combination of you know uh, bird and dog, if we combine them, it becomes cat or something." No, it becomes bird dog. Um, uh, okay, so um, we have these within the context of programming a lot. Um, it it turns out that. Um, we have them in the context of of um, monoid of monads as 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 well. Um, so uh, monads do serve this monoidal role, as we've talked about, and it's reflective of uh, using join to combine, take a list of lists events and turn it into a list events by, you know, going and flattening it. Um, and we can do that with any uh, any monad. Um, but we have quite a few other examples as well. We talked about these previously, I won't go into it, but one of the places these are most useful, of course, is when we have some sort of accreting going on over time. So we wanna fold over a list, uh, for example, um, to go and kind of add it up. Or we wanna take that list and, and reduce it with some other associative operations. Right? Um, we wanna uh, multiply the things out. Or, or what have you. Um, you want to take their logical and across the entire list, the, the Booleans in the list. Um, or where you want to do that in an incremental way and kind of add things up uh, as you go and have a running total through the list as a list as an output. So the, these things are used all the time. And, and monoids within Haskell programming are, are these basic building blocks you use in pieces. And, and we may return to that point later. So I noted they, they play this, uh, this huge role within category theory, um, and they played a big role in our discussion of monads. Now, um, we're going to, because these play such a big role, it's perhaps not surprising that in, an, in as much as functors are structure preserving mappings between categories, right? Um, they they, they uh, seek to preserve structure. Um, well, basic functors preserve the structure associated with the basic rules of being a lawful category. It's perhaps not surprising that there are these special types of functors that preserve the structure associated with monoids. 
that given one monoidal category and it's mapping to another monoidal category, these functors will not just preserve the, the basic rules of categories, but they'll, they'll, they'll conserve, they'll honor the structure associated with the monoids. For example, mapping unit in one monoid to unit in another monoid, um, or mapping the combination of things in one monoid to a combination in another monoid. Um, in order to discuss this, I need to remind you of bifunctors and then of monoidal categories, which make use of bifunctors. So I hope you'll forgive me, but um, if we have uh, category C here, um, recall that given a category C, we can define a product category of C with itself. Um, in a, in a fairly straightforward way, right? Um, this product category can be thought of as having pairs of uh, objects in the original category. So if we have object A and the object C, we can get an object A cross C. Um, and you could think of it as kind of a, a comma C, right? It's, it's uh, keeping both of those. Um, okay. Um, so same thing with A and A, right? Um, so uh, here's A, A and A, for example. And, and, and in general, any two objects here will have a corresponding object, but, but not just that, any two morphisms, right? Because we have a morphism uh, F from A to B, A cross A is gonna have uh, a morphism F times F to B times B. That's because the first A maps to the first B and the second A maps to the second B. Yeah, um, but the plot thickens, right? Because if you have A and C, for example, mapping both to B, you can get a map from A cross C to B cross B that's F cross G because you have this map and you have this map. And so you can, you can get that map there. Hmm. Um, so we, we have this bifunctor, or so we have this product category for a given category C. The product category has not just objects, which are pairs of objects, but morphisms, which are pairs of morphisms. Um, and you'll note that, for example, that even though C is morphism to D called H, there's no morphism from A to D. And so if, if we find a C, for example, um, we're not going to get, or for, for example, a, um, oh, uh, yes, we're not going to get a, a, a morphism to uh, A cross D uh, from from that pair, because there's no morphism going from A to D, right? Um, so here we have this, this product category and a product category is a, uh, is a basic uh, construct we can build for, for uh, any category by itself. We can take its product with itself. We could also do it with other categories, but for our focus here is on C cross C. And we introduced before this notion of a bifunctor whose job in life it is to map from the product category with itself back to the, uh, or, or to, another, to another category. Um, and um, a bifunctor uh, is, is this mapping from the product category into a destination category, okay? Um, and here we're gonna focus on bifunctors that are from this back to this. Um, and, and these are going to map, well, they're functors, objects in, um, in okay, this is, uh, 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 this is backwards um, because we're mapping from uh, an object here, um, so, uh, okay, uh, yeah, there's, there's an object C cross C. So four objects, C1 and C2 and, and C. There's an object C1 uh, 
C1 cross uh, tensored or or tensored with C2 um, that that uh, maps to uh, some object in C, right? To some other object um, yeah, in C, to object C3 in C. So sorry, I don't want to go that, uh, leave that confusing. Okay. Um, and this should not have a comma in it, right. Um, so bifunctor here, we're focusing on C cross C to C going from here to here. And it's mapping any given object into an object here. And it's mapping any given morphism into morphism back in C, right? Um, uh, okay. Um, and uh, that morphism that it maps back uh, has to be itself the result of mapping over the corresponding things. So for example, H time, or so let's take F time G here from AC to BB. Uh, this one has got to be mapped into a morphism that goes from whatever the bifunctor map they see to over there to whatever the morphism map B, B cross B to. Um, it, the morphism has to go uh, between it. And um, if you watch the second video that I, I referred you to, uh, lecture 16 here, um, you would have seen us starting to get into profunctors and, and we're coming there, but um, we won't be covering profunctors today, except to note right here that bifunctors are this kind of less interesting cousin of profunctors. Profunctors are really the really interesting thing. So here we go, we have this bifunctor. So this bifunctor is gonna map things from here into things in C that are the, the tensor, uh, tensor product here um, uh, of these. So we have AD going into a, a tensor D over back in C. We have BA going to B tensor A back in C. This is just some object, B cross A, right? Um, B, B tensor A is just some object in C. Uh, and and uh, a bifunctor here will be mapping between them in this way and it will need to map morphisms uh, in the appropriate way. And I, I don't show all the details on that. So bifunctors are basically mapping C cross C into C. It's, and you know, a lot of, lot of verbiage here, but the basic gist of it is you have a way of combining any two objects from C into a single object in C. That's the best way to think about it, I think. So given any two objects in C, give me a C and give me a D, this bifunctor defines what their product is, you know, C cross, C tensor D. It's just, it's some assignment of products to all these objects in, in uh, C cross C, right? Um, that's what that is. This product category is just a fancy name for getting these together as pairs so that we can then map them over, right? And and the same thing holds true with morphisms. Now you notice that this did, doesn't itself, the, the construct of bifunctor doesn't itself force any preservation of structure. Like this is not saying anything about, oh, there's an identity element. And if you, if you have a pairing of it and any other element in C cross C, it's got to map over to just that other element and, and C, no, no, no. A bifunctor is a general construct that just is some mapping between this product category and, and C itself um, that can take any pair of things and turn them into a single thing. Okay, I um, mean, that holds true for morphisms and it holds true for, for objects, but with the structure there, the morphisms have to be, if, if you have morphism from one thing to another thing, the morphism has to itself map over to the morphism in the target category between the mappings of those two ends. Okay, so using this construct of bifunctor, we had talked about it, and this wasn't too long ago, it was one or two lectures ago, monoidal categories. And monoidal categories use this construct of a bifunctor, um, of a category back to itself, C cross C to C. Um, to build up a, 
additional structure um, on top of that, richer structure and, and more, um, I don't know if I'd say richer, it's, it's more, um, certainly more beautiful. It's, it's more, uh, um, more regular, uh, more orderly structure, uh, perhaps is a better way to put it. Um, so not only do we have this bifunctor, but it, it needs to be a, a nice bifunctor. It needs to be a bifunctor that has these monoidal properties to it. Can't just be any sort of slapping down of these things over here and C cross C into, into C. Um, no, it's we we need we need to have it preserve these monoidal properties. So there's got to be an object in C over here, and therefore represented over here on C cross C as members of pairs which represents the identity object, okay? And um, this is some object in C, we call it I, it's the identity. So if, if C were set and we were dealing with pairing up of things, um, for example, the identity might be the empty set. Um, and this identity is some object in C, it's some special object in C, which when we pair it with anything else um, and take their tensor product, it's got to give that something else, right? And and so that's what these properties of unitality say. They, hey, look, if, you know, if if you have this product category and you have this bifunctor that maps from that product category over to here, one of these guys is 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 identity. Is this is this unit, I should say, object? It's got a map to that that um, just the other thing it's paired with when when we map it over. Um, anything tensored with it has got to give that anything back. Um, anything tensored with I has to give that other thing back, regardless of the order they're in. So uh, that's a orderliness that's not captured in any old bifunctor. Bifunctor might do all sorts of weird things subject to the rules of, of functors and categories, but, but uh, uh, a monoidal functor has this nice property of, of capturing the monoidal structure. So I needs to be able to be combined with anything else to give that other thing back. And it needs to have an associativity property as well. Um, and uh, importantly for our discussion, there's, there's three common um, kind of loosenings associated with this. One is a strict monoidal category where C tensor I is just equal to C. Um, but then there's weakenings of that, which just say that they're that they're uh, isomorphic, naturally isomorphic, or there's a natural transformation between them. So to be a little bit um, to to sort of make this a little bit clear for those who haven't reviewed the previous lecture, which included this, if we have C, C is a monoidal category if it comes equipped with, if it's associated with a bifunctor, which observes these properties, right? The bifunctor basically tells C how to multiply things, how to, how to combine things together, any two elements. And C needs to be equipped with one of those that observes these properties in C. And it's strict. If these are equalities, it's if there are natural isomorphisms between these, it's just isomorphic. Maybe the parentheses in the wrong place, but it's it's basically isomorphic. You know, think of like having a a pair of unit in Haskell, um, which doesn't add any information. There's only one possible thing of it, and any any old int, um, then then really the information is 
is just the same as the the int itself. Or think about having a an empty string um, paired with any other string. I mean, it's it's just the same information that was in the other string. Or maybe there's a natural transformation between a polymorphic function and, and Haskell. Um, now, monodal categories have to observe some monodal coherence laws. Um, and uh, these, these capture associativity and, and unitality. And I, I won't dwell on these um, because we've covered this in a previous lecture, but, um, but basically these capture the fact that you can mine on any on either side with something and then map it down with this this way of combining things with which this category is associated with, you know, we'll, we'll get back that other thing itself. And these have to commute. These have to, you go either way, you get the same thing. Okay. Um, now, so a strict monoidal functor here um, it has got to be something which maps uh, in a nice, okay, sorry. So monoidal category, these are monoidal categories. We start with functors. Functors are these structure preserving mappings that preserve the structure associated with the basic category. Um, need, the structure needed to guarantee categories. We then we talked about monoids and, and, and their structure. Now we have introduced monoidal categories. And now we're talking about a functor type that, that preserves um, not just any old categorical structure, but the structure of these monoidal categories. So we have these monoidal categories that aren't all just any old category with any old structure. These have these extra structure. They, they come equipped with these monoidal product. They come equipped with this way of combining any two elements to get another element. They, they're associated with this identity, this special identity element. And those have to play together nicely. So you combine with the tensor product with the identity, you get that other, you know, with any other object, you get that other object back, et cetera. So a monoidal functor is gonna be a structure preserving mapping between monoidal categories. Um, and just like a functor preserves basic categorical structure, this is going to preserve the structure associated with these monoidal structure. Um, so it's going to honor the identities by mapping identity to identity. So if you have an identity in one, and you have this monoidal functor between them, the identity in one has to map to the identity of the other. So that you know you combine over and see with the identity um, and you get the other thing back. And the same thing is true with where the identity is mapped to. Um, so you're probably starting to smell, okay, this is gonna have some nice properties associated with it. Um, for example, maybe we'll map um, uh, from, you know, a monoidal category associated with natural numbers and plus and zero, we'll map zero. And we're gonna maybe map that over to a a monoidal category associated with uh, strings and and appending and the empty string. And so we'll map zero over to the empty string. Ah, okay. Um, and then we, we have to do something more than that though. We have to have this nice, the, the, the two monoidal products have to play together nicely. Um, they can't, you know, clash on things. Maybe one is cruder than the other. Maybe one is coarse graining the other, but they can't, they can't have contradictory things. Um, maybe one's more just approximate, um, but it's, it's an approximation that's consistent with the other one. Um, so uh, here we're going to have uh, a way that, look, if, if we, go through, and it may not be obvious when you glance at this immediately, but the basic idea is, look, if we go and we map any two objects uh, over, and then we combine them in the destination category, um, that needs to be similar to, or for strict uh, monoidal functor equal to, um, the results of first combining them with the monoidal product in the source category and then mapping them over. Okay, so like if we had A and C here, right? Um, 
we could first map them over, right? Over, over. so A goes over to, uh, I've imposed a, a sort of donut-like toroid on this. Uh, so it wraps around, I didn't take advantage of it vertically, but it wraps around horizontally. So A maps over to F of A, C maps over to F of C. And then we're going to have a product associated with them over here um, that is induced by the, by the monoidal product in, in D. Remember a monoidal category, it's equipped with a monoidal product. So, so D has a monoidal product and we can combine A and C with that to get a monoidal product up. Great. Um, and uh, alternatively though, we could take A and C here and we can combine them, we could hit them with this monoidal product over here in C. And then we could map that over. And we've got to get the same, the same, same thing if it's a strict monoidal functor. We need to have the same, same object we would have gotten by mapping uh, A and C over independently and then hitting it. So both of these converge in this object. And that's what we're taking advantage of with a monoidal functor. Now, monoidal functors come with three levels of strictness. Uh, the first is called strict. And that's where, hey, if these guys get mapped over and, and this is the object, it's got to be exactly the same object that we get if we combine A and C over here and then map over. Um, that'd be a strict one. But there's other ways of relating how f of a f of a tensored with f of b over in d um, could be very similar to basically the same as f of a cross b over in c. Um, well, so a strict is they're equal. Uh, a strong would be well they're. Look, they're, they're not equal, but they're basically the same. I mean, it's just a matter of where the parentheses are. It's the same information. It's, there's no added information. It's just they're isomorphic to each other, and naturally so. Um, uh, we covered natural isomorphism, I think, in a, in a previous uh, lecture, uh, in one or two slides. Um, there's Additionally, this lax monoidal functor, which plays an outside role for our discussion, because it's those that are equivalent to applicatives. Now, lax monoidal functor is looser. Um, it says, look, okay, the, the, the results of mapping over and then combining over in D don't have to be the same as combining in C and then mapping over. Um, they don't even have to be isomorphic as long as there's a, a natural transformation going from the first to the second. As long as there's a polymorphic function that maps between, that's fine. Um, remember that natural transformations themselves capture structure. They, they need to be lawful, quite lawful things. Um, they're not any old mapping. Uh, they have to have a way that, that makes sure the structures are consistent. If you go back to our lectures of that, and and this has some lawful structure, but it's a lot looser than equality. I've shown sort of strict strict case here. Okay, so um, this monoidal functor also has to observe associativity and unitality, and kind of for the balance of the lecture, I'm going to be egregiously kind of loose uh, about that. One might say, I'm gonna be lax about that. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, hopefully future renditions of this, I'll, I'll, I'll improve that side of it. Okay, um, so let's go back to our category Hask. Category Hask, we have, it's a category of types and functions, quasi category. Um, and I want to focus on this issue of monoidal functors. What's going on here? Well, first of all, all functors we're going to deal with in Hask are 
endopunctures. They're going from has to has. Remember, we saw that earlier, right? We had punctures, which went from types to types. So we had float to list to float, or or bool to list to bool, or or you know uh, double to tree of double, or or integer to to array of integer, what have you. Um, these are all endopunctures here. They're going from has to has. Yeah. Um, now we're going to treat monoidal product within Hask if we have, so, so we're going to be dealing with monoidal functors here, functors that have to preserve properties, these lax monoidal functors um, in Hask. And where we're going to treat monoidal product with which a, a monoidal functor Monoidal functor is going to map from a monoidal category to a monoidal category. And each monoidal category is equipped with the bifunctor. So what's the bifunctor? We're mapping has to ask where there are monoidal functor. What's the what's the the tensor product associated with it? What's this bifunctor, the tensor bifunctor for each of them? Well, it's just gonna be pairing up. Okay. It's gonna be pairing up with things. So if we have a tensor B within Hask, it's just gonna be pairing them. Pretty good bit of tuple, a pair. Um, and if if you reason about that, I mean, so the monoidal product has got to just be pairing with something that gives no extra information. You know, if you paired it with, if, if, if you add A cross B and, and you add one of the things being int and the other one being bool. Now you've got a lot more information. If you have a pair of int and bool, then you just did with int by itself. You've got twice as much information because bool could be true or could be false. Um, and so we're going to add something that carries no extra information. It's the only possible value it could have. And it's, it's going to be paired up, not with something that can have two possible values, therefore would double the information or it's going to pay up for something that could have one possible value only. Only one stinking value associated with it is possible. And what is that thing? It's unit. The unit object of unit type. And, and, it, it can, and it can only have one possible value. Okay. So pairing it up with anything else is not going to add any information. So look, the idea is if we, if we have an inch and we pair it up with a singleton, this little singleton thing, this little unit. Um, basically, it's the same as an int. We're not adding in any information. Every int is carried around this 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 uh, extra unit. I mean, what, what what information do we have? We still basically just have a number. That's all. The other bit of information doesn't add anything. It's just kind of a, a vestigial appendage or what have you. Okay. Um, so monoidal unit is going to be that. Now, um, this might get you thinking because you could start to see why we need some laxness here. Um, because if we pair up A and B, if we tensor A and B and then tensor with C, we'll get kind of a, a comma B and then all comma C, which is not, not exactly the same as, as A, you know, pairing up A and B comma C. Um, those are different. They, they contain this inf information, but they're, they're different. We can losslessly convert between them. They're isomorphic. So we need something looser than strict because they're not going to be strict. They would fail the strictness test if they're the same thing. So they wouldn't be associative, but they would be isomorphic. Um, and, and that gives us some flexibility. Okay. So here, um, I'd ask you to remember these things. We're going to pair things up, and we're going to have unit as the monoidal unit. Uh, so when we treat a monoidal functor from has to hask, this is our tensor. This is our unit. And we're going to be needing to map from unit in one to unit in the other. And we're going to need to map from um, in a way that preserves this, um, uh, that honors this, this combination, not in a strict way, but in a, 
in a way that's uh, lax. Um, okay. And I'd ask you to further recall that natural transformations in Haskell correspond to, so, so um, when we talk about natural transformation, really in a Haskell context, that's uh, equivalent to a parametrically defined polymorphic function by this notion formalized in this, in this famous paper uh, uh, that, that basically uh, says theorems for free. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, a monoidal functor here is going to be a functor that's mapping from monoidal category to monoidal category. Uh, it's a functor, it can lift functions, but it's got to be equipped with two natural transformations and observe some laws. Um, the natural transformations may look familiar here. I, I, you know, talked about this obviously just a few minutes ago, but I want to dive into it in more detail here. So this first natural transformation is called eta. You should start to think if, if you see an eta here after so many lectures on monads, um, you should start to think why is this called eta, right? Uh, and you recall that eta and monads basically served as a natural transformation from the identity functor on a category into the monad um, uh, within, that, within that category. Um, so it was from C to T of C. Um, it was from the identity functor on C to the, to the monad applied on, on, on category C. And that was an endo functor. Um, here we're, we're not in general dealing with two of the same categories, but for Hask we will be. And this will end up looking basically quite a lot like it did with, um, with monads um, because it's a natural transformation from the identity functor on D to F of the identity functor on C. And if F is an endo functor, we got something that looks very similar to to what we have with monads, right? Um, okay, so uh, here C and D would be the same for an endo functor. Now, the other thing we have should also look a little bit familiar. It's mu, and remember mu for monads stand, stood for multiplication, right? It was multiplying two things. Oh my God. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so here we have something that is, involved in multiplication. And basically what this says, its form is a little bit different, but you know, there needs to be a mapping between mapping over C and D or C1, C2 and combining them in D. And that needs to be able to have a natural transformation to um, first combining them in C and then mapping them over. It needs to be a natural transformation here. Okay, so um, this is a monoidal functor. Uh, monoidal functors are going to have this way of combining two things uh, mapped over and mapping it to just um, that uh, that thing you know, applied um, to the the two uh, to the to the combination of those two original things, and this should remind you a little bit of monad context where we had t t t being mapped to t. Right? Um, okay, so I'd like to talk. So this is a monoidal functor uh, because this, these are natural transformations. We're dealing with lax monoidal functors uh, where we have natural transformations between these things. Okay, um, now there's uh, a use case that Brendan Fong articulates within that lecture 16 of the MIT Programming with Categories IAP course. Um, and in this use case, um, uh, the basic deal is that um, we're going to seek to generalize functors um, to to have 
greater versatility. Specifically, a functor can given can lift any morphism to be a morphism from f of uh, a to f of b. So any morphism from a to b, this morphism takes an a and returns a b, we can turn into a mapping from f of a to f of b. So for example, uh, a morphism is negative from floats to bools, we can turn it into a morphism from lists of floats to lists of bools by, by lifting it with functors, right? Um, but all it's dealing with there is, is a single list of, of floats, right? And, and this, this morphism is just taking uh, a float and returning a bool. It's not, it's not combining multiple things at the same time. Um, it take a float and it's returning a bool. And, and we could turn it something that maps list of floats to list of bools. But, but how if we wanted to deal with not, not just a single float, but we want to deal with um, multiple, multiple floats. Uh, for example, to know if one is bigger than the other, for example. Uh, we, we couldn't easily lift that to operate on list of floats to list of bools. We need to do something different. Um, and uh, these constructs we'll be looking at will allow us to do that. So suppose we wanted to map, yeah, this, this binary function um, uh, on, on the basic values into a binary function on the lifted values, on the, on the, the functor. So we wanted to go from something that takes a, a float and a float and returns a bool to something that operates on list of floats, list of floats, and returns list of bools saying whether the value in the first list compared to the corresponding value in the second list is, is greater. Um, and, and sort of concept this, this resulting list of pools. Um, so here we'd like to be able to operate on, on multiple values and uh, we want a way to do that. And, and so if you look at this in, in Haskell terms, we, uh, you can kind of uh, uncurry this. I mean, this is not Haskell specific. Currying is is sort of enshrined because of adjunctions. Adjunctions are what might guarantee that currying is safe, that it can that it can work uh, without you, know, you can convert losslessly between two points of information. But if we want to map this to this, we can go through a, a currying procedure, and um, instead of taking A and B as a pair we can first take A and then take B, right? Um, uh, and then take, and, and then give us a C. Uh, equivalently, you could think of it as taking an A and turning a, something that's waiting for a B and, and then when given it is, is given a C. So here we can think of what we want, rephrasing it as taking an A and then taking a B and, take it, and, and giving a C. We want to, take that thing we want to turn it into something which can operate in comparable comparable lists, comparable maybes um, that could operate on on these elaborated values um, and and so this is what we want um, given this ability to operate on individual values we want this ability to operate on generalized values effectful values. Um, uh, elaborated values, containers of values, however you want to, uh, you prefer to think about it um, for your case. Okay, here we go. Um, now, um, uh, so this is, this is kind of the motivated uh, case. Minoto functors, we talked about in general. Let's talk about Minoto functors in Haskell, okay? Um, so a Minoto functor is, is this functor that preserves monoidal structures when mapping. And we said that monoidal structures when Haskell, we're going to be, um, we're going to be imposing. So monoidal product will just be pairing and monoidal unit will be this, um, this unit, um, singleton, singleton. Um, and uh, any functor 
within a Haskell context is an endo functor. Um, it's nowhere to go but has. Has to has. Okay. Um, just like a functor might lift types into lists of those types. Um, and we're going to have a monoidal functor in Hask if it's equipped with two natural transformations. And, and as we said, natural transformations in Haskell through the theorems for free paper are parametrically polymorphic functions. Okay. Uh, they're functions, they're, they're polymorphic functions which don't special case any particular type. That's what I mean by parametric. They apply a rule across the board for, for all types. Okay. Um, so we need two of these. Um, and um, um, right. Um, so uh, the first, well, these are just the ones we get through here. So the first is going to be something that basically maps uh, the, the unit in the source category, excuse me, in the target category to F of unit in the source category. And well, well wait, the source and target category are the same here. So it really this is mapping unit in the target category to unit in the same category, right? To F of unit in the same category. So we want something that maps unit. This is the identity. Well, then that that monoidal category as used in Haskell. This is our, our monoidal unit, and it needs to map it to F of of this singleton, like lists of singletons, right? Um, now, um, so so here we have. Um, a need for this natural transformation. Now it turns out that if, if you think about it, and we talked about this, I think one of our very first lectures, and I think I had an exercise which included this. Um, if you have a singleton map to anything else, you consider all the possible functions from one possible stinking value to any other set. Well, how many functions are there? Well, there, there's one of those functions for each possible value of the target set. I mean, each function just says its value. It just says what value it maps to because there's only one possible input value. So the job of this function at life is to, is to spit out a value it's 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 just that function is it it's associated with a value in whatever returns uh so if there's a function that that takes in a singleton and it returns a bool really that's just another name for a value of bool an element of bool either that function always says true or that function always says false there's nothing else for it to say. It's a pure functional. It can only take one value. And so it, it's got to always say the same thing, right? It, it's not like it has to look at the input value and say, what value of the input is it? I have to pick the result. No, no, no. Just, it's just, it's a knee jerk reaction. It's like, yeah, uh, you know, give this value a bool. True, true. I, I am true, um, right? Um, so, this thing is really just a name for f of 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 the singleton. It's just it's some value in this type f of singleton. List of singleton. It's it's some particularly list list of singletons. Maybe it's a single singleton. Maybe it's the empty list of singleton. But it's some particular value in a list of singletons. Okay. Um, and uh, and that this this point about these special types of values from a singleton to anything else is is something which comes up again and again when we're dealing with sets and in, in category theory, and it, it allows for all sorts of wondrous, um, nice little demonstration. But the other thing we need to provide is a natural transformation uh, from from the 
I'll, I'll go back and, and show it again. The, the combination of these with tensor product in, in the destination category to the combination, the F of the combination of the source category. Now again, destination and source categories are the same here. So that affords us um, a certain amount of conceptual simplicity. But more than that, our tensor product within Hask is, is pairing. So really what we need is some way to go from a pair of f of c1 and f of c2 uh, to go to f of the pair c1 comma c2. Um, so here, it's not like f is taking two different arguments as a functor. No, no, it's, it's the pair of c1, c2, okay? Um, so we, we need some way to, to, to sort of do this. And, and if, you, if you think about it, because these are pairs, um, uh, we could actually rearrange this to be a, any pair, you could turn losslessly with no change of information into a curried function. So that it takes an f of c1 and goes to f of c2, um, uh, something, something along these lines. Um, and in fact, the same thing could be done um, could be done here. And and so, making this rearrangement, um, we could say, okay, well, we're seeking is something that takes an f of, of of the first thing, then takes an f of the second thing, and then it then it returns f of a comma b. Now, it's important to note here. This is is important because the notation can be confusing. You know, jobs functors in life is to lift functions, but I, I want to emphasize this F here is the functor. So, so what this is saying is, for example, that it's going to take a list of A and, and then, then take a list of B and then take and give you back a list of A comma B. This is not, this F is not a function. It's a, it's a, it's the functor. Um, and uh, F might be monad, uh, a monad. It might be maybe, for example, um, uh, or or maybe F is um, uh, is a is a thing which uh, maps it into a tree, what have you. But it's a um, it's some sort of structure that that is generalizes values of of A, or generalizes values of B. So what this is kind of doing is it's taking a, a generalized value of A, um, generalized value B, and putting them together, packaging them up together as pairs. That's really what, what's going on here. We're packaging them up as pairs, right? Kind of zipping them together for those familiar with that concept who, who took, took uh, some of my courses in past years. So it's kind of like zipping them up. We're, we're kind of bundling them together A and B without processing them particularly. Um, and, uh, and that's useful. So think of this as taking a list of A and a list of B, and then we get a list of A comma B pairs. Okay, that's, that's great. Now, there's some um, additional axioms or additional rules um, that, that I'm not showing here. Um, that follow from this and Hask, and I'm, I'm going light on that here or else and elsewhere, uh, unfortunately. But, you know, we can get this kind of monoidal definition in Haskell that says, if we're given a functor F, um, if F is a functor, um, we can uh, define this monoidal type class, which has a unit value of F of unit, um, some particular value of that and drawn from this type, like a, maybe it's a, again, an empty list. Um, and it has to be able to process this. And that's this mu thing. Um, uh, that should really be written with the greater than or less than um, signs around it. Okay, so, so these monoidal functors, uh, you could think of them and, and you know, I, I like Adelbert Chang's um, uh, sort of thoughts on this. Uh, he has a very nice video, which I've, I've given you in the last slide, um, which, which 
does combine some elements of the theory with some elements of the, uh, with many elements of practice. But basically you could think of a uh, monoidal functor here as kind of providing a way of taking multiple independent values and, uh, and zipping them into a single container um, without alteration. And so it, it takes both these independently um, you have a list of A's and you have a list of B's um, and you package them up. So you have a list of ints and a list of bools and you get a list of int comma bool pairs, right? Um, that's what it can do. It, it supports operating a multiple, multiple of these. Now, we still wanna get back to this use case here. Um, um, so, uh, we're, we're about to about to do that. And what we're going to see is that we're going to be able to map these kind of n-ary, here binary operations across multiple containers of, um, of these values in isolation with no, no sequencing in contrast to, to, uh, to monads. And Edelberg uh, and Chang in his, um, uh, in his talk uh, notes the associativity laws, which are I've taken his phrasing of them associated with this. Um, it's got to play nicely in an associative uh, appropriate way where this tensor product operation is, is this operation here, which I'll, I'll put in like, like that. Um, so we have, uh, we have these associativity laws uh, which are associated with, with this and this identity, identity laws. So this unit operation um uh we it needs to to play nicely with the uh, uh with this uh tensor product so this is tensor product here um okay now um how given this structure how do we go about addressing our use case of combining lifting functions of two arguments into things that can apply on in the lifted domain to say, how do we take binary functions and apply them to pairs of lists to get out a, a, a list that's the result? Well, um, look, um, just reflect that, you know, if, if you have a traditional functor and we have a function A to B, we can get out a, a a mapping, this is the lifting, right? That goes from F of A to F of B. It goes from lists of A to lists of B. And um, uh, we can use this to, to, to lift functions of, of two arguments in the following way. Okay, so the idea is look, um, first of all, we can write this, we saw this earlier, as this, this was just the result of currying uh, both sides. That's what we did two, two or three slides ago. That was this thing. Um, so this is what we want. And, and here's the thing, look, this is what we're given and this is what we wanna return. So we're trying to solve this programming problem of we get this and we wanna be able to turn into that using the power of these monoidal functions. How do we do that? Well, look, we're given this so we can uncurry it. Uh, you know, we could losslessly transform this by getting the A and getting the B, we could turn it into an A. Once we get the A and, and get the B, we could turn it into a pair of, 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 of A comma B. And, and, um, and, and, and given, Given this thing, we could answer it with this. If we have a function which does this, we could have we could provide a function which takes a pair of a and b and and returns a c by just kind of sequencing those accordingly by giving it to each of those. Um, and so this the thing that we're given allows us to do this. That's probably the best way to put it. Allows us to take a pair of a and b and and have a c. And and since we could do that. Um, we can lift this thing with F, right? Or we can lift any old function with 
the functoriality of F. M and F, we can lift any old function. And, and this is one function we could, we could give. So given this function by somebody, we could take, have, provide this function, we could lift it to be from F of A comma B to F of C. Okay, we're starting to get some whiffs of hope here because now we've got an F of C coming back, but where are we gonna get this F of A, of A, B coming from? Well, this F of A comma B pair, where can we get that from? Well, we can get it from right up here. That's what a monoidal functor gives us. Um, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, this is what the monoidal functor gives us. It gives us uh, this, this ability to, to take, take these two things, uh, an F of A and an F of B and get an F of A comma B. So we know we can, we can get that. Um, if we were given an F of A and F of B, we can F, get an F of A comma B. Um, but that's exactly what we want. We want to return something which takes an F of A, takes an F of B. This is the value we want to return. We, we're, our job in life is to have taken a function like this. We want to return a function like this. So this function we return, it's going to get an F of A, get an F of B. By hitting it with, with this monoidal product operation, we can get an F of A, B. And having gotten an F of A, B back, we can then apply to it this lifted function, uh, F of A, B to F of C that we could produce through this. So. So in short, we can apply this guy first um, to get this, and then we can apply uh, this one. Um, so this should actually say this, this thing um, to get to an F of C. And so given this, we can render it into something which will return a function that given an f of a and f of b will return an f of c and we do it by sequencing this and then sequencing the lifting of of the curried form of or the uncurried form of this guy here um and that will return an f of c so in short given a combination of this monoidal product operation and what we're given we can get this back that's one way to solve this programming problem such that we can take a binary function in and return a binary function of generalized values, uh, including say a list, a pair of lists and return a, a single list that combines the corresponding elements. Um, now, I should note that Kurian comes from an adjunction, uh, given the time here and that I have a hard stop today at noon. Um, I don't think we'll have time to go into it today, but just I'll, I'll observe that the correctness of currying, the, the ability to do currying is, is guaranteed by um, the adjunction between pairing on the one hand an exponentiation on the other. And it's a, it's a very nice sort of uh, property. If you have a left adjoint that pairs things up um, with, in this case, uh, T, and you have a right adjoint that uh, takes things uh, to the eighth power, you, you are guaranteed to have by virtue of the properties of adjunctions. And, a natural isomorphism between these two things. There's an isomorphism between Hom sets here. Um, that means they're in one-to-one -one correspondence. Given one, you can losslessly go to the other. And that guarantees we can losslessly convert in a fashion that's called currying or a fashion that's called uncurring. Um, this is a rather nice uh, adjunction. Um, and it's an adjunction whose correctness is guaranteed uh, by virtue of, of adjunction uh, policies. Now, I'll, 
I'll just note here that um, this, this exponentiation, um, this notion of, of B to the A, um, that may be an unfamiliar notation, but what it really means is functions from A to B. And I'd like to raise some, some sense about why this is. It just seems like an arbitrary thing. B to the A is, is a kind of a, a name for A to the B. It's in these so-called closed categories where we have something in our objects that corresponds to elements of the Hom set, things from A to B over here in C have an object associated with them, um, a, um, a arrow B, that, that um, there's this, uh, that's a feature of closed categories. And I'd like to give a little bit of intuition about why it works so nicely. So, so consider B to the A and consider A, a um, functions from A to B. Um, if you start to think about the correspondence between the two, it's rather compelling. First of all, look, um, any function from A to B, you could think of, for us as computer scientists, it's kind of easy for us to think of it as kind of a lookup table, right? It takes the value of A, Imagine A is uh, bools, and we're mapping from bools to ints. Well, whatever this function is, we could represent it as a lookup table. From for false, we map it to three. For you know, for um, true, we map it to seven. Right? Um, it's it's a lookup table, and specifically for each value of A, each of the A values we need to specify a B that it maps to, right? It's a lookup table from A's to B's. Um, and, and so we could write a lookup table like that. We just have to list out A many B's, the number of elements of A for bool of two are particularly simple. We just have to list out the values of B that it maps to, right? For this value of A, we map it to this value of B. For that value of A, we map it to that value of B. This is a lookup table, right? And, and, and look, that's, if, if you kind of think of B to the A, it's like B being multiplied by itself A times. And multiplication is pairing up. It's kind of successively pairing things up in a row. That's what that multiplication is. It's, it's tupling things. So we have a tuple of A different values of B. That's what that is. It's like multiply B, 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 A times, right? That's what squaring is, B times B. That's what cubing is, B times B times B. Um, it's just B that many times. And so it's, it's like a tuple. Um, this thing can hold B, the size of B to the size of A possible values. Um, and, uh, and that's exactly what we get here. It can, if you think about A being mapped to, for example, um, if B is, if B were bools, um, true, false, each value of A, it, we can give an indication of its, whether it's true, false. This is like, and this is like uh, bit vectors. For, for each value of A, we have to specify what bit it corresponds to. It's, it's like a bit vector of length A, where each value of A has a certain value of true or false associated with it. So it can hold B to the A possible values. B here might be two, for example, in which case it would be two to the A um, possible values um, to the you know, number of elements of A. Um, if we have no possible values of B, there are no values to specify. There's no possible function, right? It's zero of these. And, and the, the same thing is true here. If you have B zero, uh, I mean, look at this, even as a mathematical expression, we get zero to any, any power greater than, greater than zero, we get back zero. There's no values to specify. Um, 
So again, isomorphic between the two, the same, same number. If we have only one possible value of A, we get B to the one, right? And if we have only one possible value of A here, it's just like picking a B. So we have B possible values, which is the same number as B, B to the one. Look, if we have A equal, um, if, if we have A equals zero, we have A equals zero, we only have one possible value. And, and here, if, if there's no possible values of A's, there's, remember the value of a function, the job of a function of life is for each possible input value to give you a value of the result. Well, there's no possible input values here. There's none, there's no possible input values. So is there a function um, mapping? Well, kind of in a trivial sense, I mean, it, it does nothing in life. It's kind of trivial function. It, it, its job in life is to do, is to do nothing. It has no, no job. So it's kind of a vacuous function and it's called absurd in, in the Haskell context or it's trivial, right? It's, it is, it is no, nothing to specify um, because it, it just is. Um, so uh, maybe this will start to give you some understanding about why it's so nice that this is B to the A. So this is an exponential object it's called and it represents functions or in general morphisms from A to B. So it's a little bit of an aside. Um, okay, I think I'll, I'll go light on this, but um, well, okay, maybe I'll say something. So Bartosz Mieluski has some wonderful material on this and in, in, in the form of uh, talks and in the form of uh, his blog, um, and probably by extension is his book. I actually haven't tapped that for this particular material. Um, but one thing that, that he, uh, this is his blog entry um, that I drew on most heavily, for this, he, he notes that, look, if you have a, a pair A and B, we could curry it and losslessly get something that takes an A and, and returns a B. For any A, we can give you a B. That's kind of what this was originally. And then we could apply F to that and get, get lifted. So it's a lifted function. Um, uh, and, and, it's a function here that's, so we have to be careful when I say we apply F, this is not a function, this is functor. I, I, I need to emphasize this, this is a functor. So we can lift it, for example, on lists. So this could be a list of functions, right? If we have a function from A to B, we can get a list of functions or maybe of functions. Um, okay. Oh, so that's a, a possibility. Um, another thing we could do is we could apply F to each of A and B, and then we could curry it. We get F of A to F of B, right? Um, and uh, with a closed functor, these have to be in one-to-one -one correspondence. So, so this is like, okay, a list of functions needs to be a one-to-one -one correspondent. For every function, for every list of functions, there needs to be a function of list. So every possible list of functions, there needs to be a function between lists um, uh, as well. And specifically, if we have a list of functions from interval, that has to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with, for each of those, there needs to be a corresponding function from list events to list of bools. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? Because for every function from ints to, for every list of functions from int to bool, um, that, that's kind of telling us, um, how to, how to map uh, from a list of ints to a list of bools, which is exactly what this is over here. Um, and give it any function from list of ints to list of bools. Um, gosh, we could create a, a, 
a list of functions that just look that up, uh, a function from intervals that just look up what it was here and, and give the corresponding value. So it says this, there needs to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. And this, this is associated with this definition of applicative. So uh, over in, in, um, in uh, monoidal, we had unit. In applicative, we have pure, okay? And, and it looks a bit different. Um, <laughs> Bartosz Milewski's uh, blog, um, power to him. Uh, he has a very impressive demonstration which stretches on for pages about basically why this is equivalent um, to, to just specifying a value through uh, for f of, of unit, which is really what you have here. And you'll notice that Brendan, Brendan Fong sidesteps this issue in his video uh, with uh, typical uh, aplomb and, and um, uh, typical uh, smoothness, but um, but in Bartosz Milewski's context, he goes through some heavy lifting to prove that they are the same using day convolution in Yoneda Lemma. And there's, <laughs> there's a rather fun video of him demonstrating it as well um, uh, in, um, in Bellevue uh, at one point. Um, so uh, with the applicative, we have this uh, splat operator here, which looks a little bit like it's corresponding monoidal form, but it has one fewer uh, star associated with it. And at first glance, this doesn't seem like immediately the same thing. It's not obvious why this is, although Bartosz goes through and demonstrates it in a very impressive way. Um, uh, but for this operator, it's even perhaps less clear because you have this, you have this thing that's basically this relationship here. You, given a, given a, a generalized function, um, like a list of function, we, we have this apply operator or app, um, which, which can then map um, uh, those, say, list of A's to list of B's. So if we have a list of functions from A to B, we can have a list of A's to, to a list of B's. Um, now, these applicative functors are, uh, are quite widely used. And in fact, they were first, gen they were first formalized, I think, um, in, in the programming community as kind of a, a useful um, functional pattern. And, um, and then they've, you know, gotten picked up and, and looked at by, by category theorists. Um, uh, and applicative uh, functors uh, uh, here, th their job in life is, is, is similar to lex monoidal functors. Uh, they provide using this operator, this operator here, a way to take these kind of generalizations of effectful or containers of functions and rendering them into a, a function of between containers, right? Um, between lists, uh, lists and lists. It reflects the fact that we have a list of functions. We could turn that into a mapping between lists um, by just applying each of those functions to each of the elements of, of the list. Um, and uh, applicative also supports, you could think of it as kind of multi applying on through lax monoidal functors on, on, on multiple containers or generalizations of values in isolation with no sequence between them. And the observation here is look, monads provide us, and I should really have a slide on this, but monads as a reminder, but monads provide this way of doing this Kleistic composition with the fish operator, right? They, given a, given a, a mapping from a function, say from, from A to, M of B, and then a function from B to M of C, we can, through monads, achieve a function from A to M of C. And it, and it doesn't just kind of mush them to, 
together, they're not independent. The second one needs to depend on the values output by the first. Um, so there's a sequentiality here. Um, monads take these two different things and they sequence them. Remember, they're capturing composition, Kleisley composition. That's what monad's job in life is. It allows you to compose these things by having one operate after the other. By contrast, applicatives in Laxman autofunctors, um, they allow you to operate on, on these kind of multiple, uh, multiple things uh, uh, that are independent of each other and combine them to get something that, that combines the effectful versions of those, the generalized versions that, that operates on pairs of lists, for example, or returns a list. Okay, so how are we gonna do that with a functor? Well, I should, so these are from Edinburgh uh, Chang, who's, who's uh, talk on this is, is really very, uh, very thought provoking. I have a lot of respect for, for his, uh, his commentary. And uh, he provides some examples and, and uh, probably it'd be worth I'm watching the time here, but it'd be worth probably just spending a, a minute or two on this because it kind of gives a sense of where this applied terminology comes from. It's not obvious this is applied, but often typically it involves applying, it involves applying a function from here to be able to map from here to here. Not surprising, right? If you have a list of functions from interval, you, in order to go from a list of n to a list of bool, you got to apply them. Um, you got to apply to the first offer, the first element of the this int list to get a bool in the first element of the, the list the list of bools. So um, he shows two examples. And um, uh, here we have, for example, an applicative um, where we have for the uh, applicative, the functor f, again, f is not function here, it's functor. Um, so it might be list or it might be here, it's either. Um, and, and basically here he's, he's, he's implementing, he's defining what this flat operator does. So look, if you have a honest to goodness function here, because we have either, it could either be a real value or it could be some sort of error indication. If it's a real value that has a function, and if our right value is some real value, that's kind of, uh, sorry, that's uh, this guy here. So if we have a real function wrapped up in this either uh, on the left, and we have a real function wrapped up in the either on the right, we get a real value wrapped up um, in the result that's just the applying F to A. Um, by contrast, if, if either one of these is, is off, if, if we don't have an honest to goodness function or we don't have an honest to goodness value, uh, we have to kind of throw our hands up and, and return our, our error message that we, we got or return our error indication that we had. So any old left uh, error combined with, with any uh, right value, here, here we don't have a function. We just return what that error is and anything that doesn't have a value, we return um, what that is. And pure here, the job of pure is to take A and inject it into this, just like it was with monads. We, we you know, injected it into the singleton monad and create a singleton, a singleton list for our, for our list, for example. Here we just have right. Um, and, uh, and then it, you could also treat uh, the list as an applicative. And uh, what this shows is, look, if you have a list as an applicative, um, then what are we getting? Well, we're getting a, a list of functions, okay? Um, and given that list of functions, say this functions from into bool, we have to be able to take a list of ends and, in, 
and go through and apply those to get a list of pools. So how are you going to do that? Well, okay, look, we're going to go through each of these lists of functions. Um, it's what it is. It's a list of functions here. Right? This is list of functions. So we're going to go through each of them. We got the head, and that's going to be combined with some list of values. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to map each of this function over the list of values, which is a list. Uh, um, and that gives us a list, which we're going to append to the rest of the work. And what's the rest of the work? Well, the rest of the work is, oh my uh, gosh, uh, no, 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 no. Um, um, so uh, this has got to be it. Um, uh, so, oh, sorry, what am I doing? What, what, what the heck um, did I just type? No, 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 sorry. It, this is uh, FT to FS. So we're, then we go through and we recursively apply the rest of the functions to, to, the, to all the values. So here I apply we're the head of the function to those values. And then we go through, we apply the rest of them um, to, to those same values uh, recursively. And hey, if we run out of functions, we got nothing else. Um, um, and pure here, just for monads, as for monads, it's just a, um, just singleton list. Um, the singleton list serves this, this value of, of pure. Um, it's a single, single list value. So this is uh, applicatives. Um, watch the time here. So, so back to our use case, right? We we want to be able to lift. We want to be able to apply um, operations that not merely to lift a function of single arguments to operate in the lifted domain. Let's say to map list to list. We want to be able to op, uh, be able to lift functions of multiple arguments to, to operate on multiple, say, lists um, to produce a single list. So how are we going to do that? Well, as before, we can rewrite this formulation, which is designed to emphasize operating on multiple values, um, to, uh, we, could, we could curry it. OK, great. And you'll recognize this from very first slide where I introduced this use case, um, and and how are we gonna how are we gonna do that? Well, look, um, I've taken the liberties of, of further putting some parentheses in here. Uh, we could curry this to be a arrow b arrow c, but but really that's that's just the same as a arrow b arrow c. You get an a and you get back a function which. Whose job in life is to take a b and return a c, right? Um, and look, if we have that function, this is what's given to us. We're we're given this, so if if we have that function, great. We have that function, um, then we lift it. We can lift it with just using the functoriality of f, the standard, bog, simple, functor stuff. We lift this to get that. Okay, we lift this to get that. Happy, happy. Um, that's that's great. But where does that lead us? Well, you can start to look at this. Now we got something very similar to what we have up here. We have an F with a function object in it. Okay, okay. And this FA is is going to start getting us towards this. Gosh, um, if we can get an FA, we can we can get this. Um, and so then we can apply this thing to get in something that goes from f of b to f of c. Okay, um, so that allows us to take in something that given an a returns a function that given a b returns a c. And we can render this through this, through this mechanism, just through lifting and applying this guy, we can we could return a function that takes an f of a and which returns a function that takes an f of b 
and returns an F of C. For example, it takes a list of A's and then it takes a list of B's and returns a list of C's. Um, now you'll notice here we lifted and then we splatted. And previously uh, we had we had gone and uh, and I think it was the, the opposite order. We applied this guy first and um, and then we lifted um, this guy here to be uh, of this form. So we did it in kind of the, the reverse order. So in short, this use case of lifting functions to two arguments of wanting to map pairs uh, of generalized values um, into a final value using just uh, a recipe for operating of the values themselves. That can be addressed with monoidal functors and that can be addressed with applicative functors. Um, we, can, we can do so uh, in either way. Now, um, so both of them allow us to support operating on multiple containers or generalizations of values in isolation with no sequencing. There's no sequencing here. We take these, um, we take these things, f of a, f of b, like this list of ints and list of bools, and and uh, we return a list of, you know. Uh, Maybe it's a list of maybe it's a list of ints and a list of ints and returns a list of bools that says whether the first is greater than the second. But there's no sequencing. There's no way in which the second one depends on the results of the first. It doesn't consume the results. Whereas in monads, it's all about that. It's all about composition of Kleisley errors. It's all about the second thing depending on the results of the first thing. That's why we have with monads. We take in a function a to a going to m of b, and we take in another function that b, the results of the first one going to m of c, and we're kind of sequencing them together. This, by contrast, doesn't. It takes um, whether it's in applicatives, although it's uh, perhaps a bit more opaque here, or whether it's in uh, monoidal in, in um, this monoidal uh, functors we're kind of taking these containers that are already there, they don't depend on each other, and we're combining them together um, using uh, operators. We're not sequencing in any ways. And, and monads provide the, the sequencing magic uh, to take that to another level. Okay. Um, so uh, I haven't provided a, a full characterization of this by any means. Uh, some of these references are really probably worth looking at if, if you're interested in either the pragmatics of it or in the deeper category theory. Um, I've gone very light on the appropriate laws, um, although they extend in fairly straightforward ways uh, out of these things, but um, uh, the unitality and the associativity do need to be maintained for both lax monoidal functors and uh, applicative functors. Um, so uh, I think next time we're going to go on to uh, to talk about a further element of, of uh, that applies to applicatives and applies to monads, um, and actually harks back to monoids, and specifically to our free monoids. So we're going to talk about free monads and free applicatives with the idea being that they're free from unnecessary restrictions. They, they have only the necessary restrictions on them. And uh, wh whereas something like plus reuses values, so we get two plus one, we get three. If we get one plus two, we get three, the same thing again, it keeps them being reused. Um, we we can have uh, monoids where combining things just yields more things. 
subject to associativity as they'll, they'll be reused forced by categorification by associativity requires you know if we have a string um string uh, a and b combined and then with c it's the same as a and and combine b and c um those those things will be a force, but nothing else. And we'll see that free monad, uh, free monads, and free applicatives um, allow us to hew to the same principle. They they don't collapse things. They don't they don't um, you know combine things together the way that reuses unless absolutely necessary for the monad laws and for categorification in monoidal monoidal uh, structure um, associated with it. So uh, I think we'll explore that next time. Uh, we may then go into profunctors or other, uh, other elements. Okay, uh, so I unfortunately have to uh, bow out here, but I hope that provided a bit of a glimpse on, the, um, on something intermediate between functors on the one hand and monads on the other, this kind of intermediate point of applicatives or or monoidal functors. Thanks very much and take care there.